Hey, what's up? It's Jared with Ditch Auto, and today I have the Sony RX100 Mark VI, and we're gonna talk about the top 10 settings that I changed on the camera first. Now, I just opened up this camera. Today is the day that everybody started receiving it. If they purchased it, of course, some folks are lucky enough to get things from Sony uh, early for review, but I bought it and here it is. As always, I have links down in the description below to the camera, the extra gear, the batteries, the SD card, anything that's gonna make your experience using this camera better, clicking on those links helps support our channel. I typically customize my camera a bit because I use other Sony cameras. I use currently the a7 III and the a7R III, and those cameras have a certain way of working and I like all of my cameras to kind of work the same. There are also kind of shortcuts and things that I have come to just enjoy that actually make the camera a little bit faster and easier to use. And so I'm gonna talk about those things in this video. Now, one of my more popular videos on the internets is my Mark V, my RX100 Mark V settings video. And in that video, here's the five. This is the one I've been using for the last couple of years here. Um, in that video, I basically did seven settings. Now, there are a few more things that I have done and came to uh, kind of enjoy as far as custom settings goes, and that's why this video has 10. Uh, I basically am just gonna get rid of my RX100 Mark V and replace it with a six. Um, I'm kind of sad that it doesn't have a, as wide of an aperture, but I'm excited to have more zoom, uh, so we'll see where that goes. And I'm definitely gonna come back and do a full review of this camera because a lot of people are gonna wonder, is it worth a little bit of extra money? Or actually, it's a bit of extra money to get the Mark VI over having the Mark V. The Mark V, of course, is still a fantastic camera by today's standards and the different features that are available today. So I definitely wanna do kind of some comparisons and talk about that in another video. So this low pro case is what I've been using. I've used it for the last several years. Actually, I think I've had it for like four years now and it's held up really well. I typically wear it on my belt when I'm out and about uh, you taking pictures and shooting video clips of my kids. I've used my Mark V, my Mark IV, and now this Mark VI as a vlogging camera quite often. I've done uh, vlogs, uh, I've done a lot of B-roll type of stuff for other videos, and so, and then I've also taken some pictures with it because it does a good job of that as well. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how I end up using this camera now because I have more cameras, I think, than I've ever had before, and so this camera still is gonna be that pocketable, go-to, quick grab camera to get all the shots and all the photos when I don't wanna carry around something much bigger. So let's talk about the first things that I think are important. I'm gonna go ahead and set that aside. Uh, I have the battery out because um, I am excited, kind of, that they're using the same battery as before. I think I'm excited because I don't have to buy new batteries and I did just get done buying a whole slew of new batteries for my A7 III and A7R III. Uh, so I'm glad not to get double taxed this year. Um, so, okay, let's jump into the camera. Uh, we're not gonna be talking so much about the features of the camera so much as the settings. This is a settings video uh, on how to customize the camera. I will come back and do a video that's more of a review, more of a walkthrough of this camera and teach everybody uh, who's interested a little bit more on how to use this camera and get excellent photos and video out of it. So the first thing that you're gonna wanna do, and this is the one thing that I have already done, is actually set your date and time. Your date and time is important to set because when you copy files and stuff like that over to your computer, that's gonna come with it, the date and time. And organizing your footage and your photos is gonna be kind of a pain in the butt. And if you upload your photos to something like Google Photos or some sort of cloud sharing service, those photos are gonna be logged in uh, in the order of the date and time that they were taken. And if the date and time is not set correctly, uh, you're gonna have a heck of a time. So if you forgot to do that, you can go over to this panel here and set up five uh, in the fifth panel and go ahead and set your date and time uh, so that all of that is done. Another thing is just put your camera in manual mode. We're not even getting started on the settings yet, but shoot in manual mode. The whole premise here of ditching auto is getting out of auto a camera like this is like, I mean, this is a $1,200 camera. You do not need to be shooting in auto. You need to learn how to use those manual settings so you can get the best looking 
footage and photos out of this little camera as possible. So put it in manual mode and start learning how to shoot in manual mode. Uh, if you need any help with that, my free course called Ditch Auto Unlocking Manual Photography is a course for you. It's going to help you understand the settings that you need to know on pretty much any type of camera that has a manual mode so that you can optimize your camera to get the best photos uh, and train your brain to be the settings that you're, you're the auto mode. You're using your eyes and your brain to control the camera and it does require a little bit of practice, but with some practice, you're gonna get much better quality content out of your little camera. All right, so let's get in. Oh, one more important thing I keep forgetting uh, is to format your card in the camera. Always format your card in the camera. Don't format it on your computer or in another camera. Before you start shooting, format. Make sure you back up the, ca the card, of course, but then format it within the camera. Formatting is uh, basically just right below the date and time. Formatting your card in the camera is the safest bet so that you don't end up with corrupted data and stuff like that. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get into the settings, the meat of this video. So tap on menu, we're gonna go just back, I'm gonna go back to the beginning here. So the first thing that we're gonna do is actually change our file format to RAW plus JPEG. Now I've had a back and forth on shooting RAW plus JPEG or just RAW. Um, I never shoot just JPEG only, but here's my thoughts on this. When I only shoot RAW, all I'm getting is RAW images. They're very large images. They're great. They're, they're exactly what I want. But, I, but when I want quick and nimble files that I can transfer over to a smartphone or that I can copy over fast for maybe editing on a phone or whatever, even though phones, most of them can edit raw files these days, the JPEG is just easier to transfer. And there's a rare, very weird circumstance that I had with my Sony a7R 3 whereas I was only shooting raw and some of those raw images ended up being, uh, something was wrong with them, they were corrupt. And if I had had the JPEGs in there, I probably would have been okay. But I lost like 15 images out of 400 and something images. It was a really weird situation, but it made me wish that I was shooting in RAW and J, uh, plus JPEG. So simply go to your first pane here, the first setting, RAW plus JPEG. If you don't care about the JPEGs, you can shoot in full RAW. Um, or if you don't care about having flexible images, you can shoot in JPEG. The raw image is gonna give you much more control over your image. It's gonna allow you to better adjust the white balance and the contrast and stuff like that. Get some of the highlights and details back in your image if your exposure was off, if you shoot in raw. Versus JPEG is a compressed image, so it's compressing, it's basically chopping the ends off of your image data so there isn't as much room to work with. Um, so I always shoot raw or raw plus JPEG. And since I just recently had that kind of snafu with my raw only files i think i'm going to be shooting raw plus jpeg for a little while now um the jpeg quality doesn't necessarily have to be set to extra fine if you are shooting raw plus jpeg uh, but if i was only shooting jpeg i would choose extra fine um, but since i'm shooting raw plus jpeg i can go with just fine quality and then i can set my jpeg quality as well now, if you're just gonna be sharing your images on Instagram or something like that, you don't even need to have your JPEG quality or image size up above medium. You can set it to, to the 10 megapixel because that's far larger of an image, not by a lot, but it's far larger of an image than what Instagram is gonna display anyways. Um, so if you're shooting in RAW plus JPEG, you're gonna get that huge, nice big RAW file that you can edit, that you can take onto your computer and use Adobe Lightroom or anything like that. Um, and then you'll have a JPEG that's a smaller compressed image that's more nimble for you know shooting uh, out to your Instagram or whatnot. Um, very, very, very simple there. So the next thing that I do is change my autofocus settings. By default, your camera is gonna be set to um, your wide focus area. And this is the wide focus area. I mean, these cameras are getting so much better at choosing what to focus on. And people have been kind of getting on me about not letting the camera do as much thinking with autofocus because that's one of the reasons that Sony is as good as it is. But when I'm shooting photos, a problem that I constantly have, whether I'm using 
the A9, the A7R3, any of these cameras, is that even though the autofocus is super good and it always, almost always picks exactly what I wanna have in focus, it sometimes picks the wrong part of what I want in focus. For example, if you're shooting you know, a person from like a side angle here, and so the, the face is tilted, you want the camera to choose that eye as the focus point. You don't want the camera to shoot the back eye or choose some further away aspect or maybe over here the, the ear or something that's a little further back to where you get just a hint of softness on the eye. You want that eye to be uh, the thing that's in focus. And most of the time the camera will get it right, but it doesn't always. And so I still use selective point focus. I don't use these, uh, these big focus areas. Um, so there's two ways that you can get to uh, change this. You can tap on the function button and then choose your focus area and go down to uh, flexible spot focus area. And there are three different sizes. So that's your medium. You can also choose your large or your small spot depending on um, you know what's what's in your scene if i'm shooting a portrait maybe something that's more close up i will use that small focus spot because it's less likely that i'm going to miss uh, if i move the camera a little bit um, what i was trying to focus on if something is further away i may use that wider spot just to make sure uh, that i get it uh, that i get that that thing in focus and i don't the camera doesn't end up searching because if that small focus spot comes off of your subject and falls off of whatever it was that you were focusing on, then it's gonna focus on something else and your entire shot's gonna be out of focus because you are kind of taking control of focus here. You're telling your camera, I don't want you to guess all over the screen, your, your available sensor. I don't want you to guess, I want you to take this exact spot and focus on it. Um, it's, it's essentially assisted manual focus because manual focus, you would have to manually focus using the ring um, and, and use the, your eye on the back of the screen to try and make sure that everything's in focus. Or maybe you could turn on some sort of focus assisting feature. But for me, this is as close as I can get to uh, manual focus while still having autofocus functionality. Uh, and it's just, it works great for me. So I essentially set that to like the medium or whatnot, and then I can move that spot all around um, of course, it's not easily moved around right now because there's one other setting that I'm going to change. But another thing that you can do is tap on those spots. So if you have a subject maybe over here, you can just tap on that area and it's going to move the focus point to that spot. This is fantastic. I absolutely love this. I use this tap on all of my cameras, um, even more so on this because it's not likely that I'm using the viewfinder here. I actually wouldn't mind if they got rid of this little pop-up viewfinder. So I'd never have my eye up on this camera or my face up to the camera. I could just simply tap and it's, it's very comfortable for me to do that. And you could even tap and drag uh, around on the screen as well, which I think is a fantastic feature uh, for, for your autofocus. Um, so uh, keeping things in order, and so I'm, I'm trying to keep things in order going down the menu but uh, there will be some settings that I'm gonna change so that that focus point can be moved around without having to touch your screen. Um, so let's go to my next setting that I'm gonna be changing, which is setting the creative style to neutral. And that is uh, just a couple of panes down here on pane nine. Creative style typically is set to standard. And so if you're shooting those JPEGs, they're going to get the standard treatment here. And of course, you can set vivid, clear, deep, light, portrait, landscape. There's all sorts of options here that you can choose from. I like neutral because it's more of a, of a flat color profile. And I'm going to be taking all of my images into some sort of an editor anyways. So I just want that. I just want that to be taken care of. I want it to be flat. I want to have more room to work with in the editor. I don't want everything to be kind of crushed already as it is. So I just set that creative style to neutral. Um, now, another thing that I find important is having a auto review of an image. By default, that's turned off. So when you go and take an image, so let's see if, uh, if I can show you that here. When you go and take an image, uh, it's ready to go. It's ready to shoot again. It's not giving you an instant replay. Now, of course, you can hit the uh, playback button here and you can, of course, see your images. But if you want that auto review, you're gonna to need to turn that on. And I kinda of like having that. 
but especially in photo mode because with a camera like this, I'm, I'm trying to maybe take some pictures of my kids. I wanna make sure I got the shot. And if I have to go and look and, and spend time clicking around to see if I got the shot, then I may miss the opportunity to take the photo again if I didn't get it the first time. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, we're gonna set that up by going to the, uh, we're gonna go back up here, it's on the second pane, just a further bit down. So the second camera tab on pane eight, auto review, set to two seconds. So now I've got my image review, as you can see, for two seconds, and then the camera kicks back on. Now, if I don't wanna wait for that two seconds, all I have to do is just press down on the, on the shutter button just a little bit, and it's gonna take me right back and to shooting photos. And if I'm in a burst mode, like I'm shooting a burst of photos, it's not even going to give me an auto review at all until I let off the shutter. So I hold down the shutter button, it takes a burst of photos, I let off the shutter button, it shows me that last one. It's not going to make it go slow, like every time it takes a picture, it's gonna take two seconds before it does it again. Um, so I like that auto review uh, taking place there. Another thing is, uh, and this is the fifth thing, is to remap the control wheel a little bit. Now, one of the things that I have done in the past is, uh, and this is standard on my other cameras, is made it easier to adjust the ISO or the ISO. So up here, you can adjust your, your zoom, of course, um, right back here, I can rotate this to adjust my shutter speed. And then of course we have the ring here to adjust our aperture, but we need to be able to easily adjust the ISO or the ISO pretty fast. And on earlier versions of this camera, like the Mark V, there just wasn't an easy way to do that. Well, on the Mark VI, they've made the trash can button or the custom button, uh, your adjustment for your ISO, which is cool, I like that, but it's not consistent with the way that I use my other cameras. I have the Sony a7R 3 and the a7 III, and I typically use the ISO where there's the flash icon here, it's ISO on those other cameras, and I want that to be ISO because that's just naturally the way that I'm gonna be using my camera. So I'm gonna go here into my settings, we're gonna go um, to custom key, down to right button, and we're gonna change that to ISO, ISO. And now I can press this to the side and just start rotating. So press right and rotate and then center to confirm. And what's nice about this is that it's exactly the way that I typically would do things on my other cameras. And so it's not gonna be confusing to me. Uh, I do like the fact that they did map it to the trash can. Um, nobody would even know that unless you happened upon it by accident. Uh, but that's, that's just not the way I typically would use the camera by using that there. Um, another thing, and this is earlier when I was talking about setting my focus points, being able to move the focus point around, I need a way to be able to verify and confirm where that focus point is. Now, if I'm not wanting to use my finger to slide around here and set my focus point, um, I'm gonna need to use this control wheel over here to move it around. So I need to set the center button from IAF. We're gonna go to focus standard. So now I can press that button and see it turns to something that allows me to move that around to each of the points on the grid and then I could press the button down to confirm. Press it again, move it around and confirm. Now, this isn't as important as it once was because having the touch screen on here makes it very easy just to go to whatever focus point I want, but it's the way that I use my other cameras and I wanna have it set up that way. It doesn't make sense for me to, uh, to have my cameras set up differently. Um, of course, on my other cameras, I'm using the EVF. On this camera, like I said, I'm not, so it's more likely that I'm going to tap to a focus point but I still wanna be able to have that functionality set. So since I went ahead and set this camera up like the other cameras with the ISO, I don't need the C or the trash can button to take me to ISO anymore. I can basically set it to do anything else. We're gonna go and do that. We're gonna uh, go to the C button and we can set this to anything, basically anything that we want. Um, there's a lot of different options that we can choose from here and um, like focus modes, uh, that's another thing I could do. I could set it to my focus mode. So that way I just tap right here and I change between AFS or AFA or even AFC, which I would only use typically in video. 
Um, you know, those are our options. And I'll, I'll talk more about those autofocus uh, type of settings in another video. Um, the, the different forms of autofocus here, such as single shot, uh, automatic AF, and continuous AF are good for different reasons, um, but that's for a whole video in and of itself. Uh, I just wanted to touch on that for a second because I, I hate it in videos where people say something and then they don't explain themselves and you're like, wait a minute, what about that thing though? So focus area might be good because then I can easily change between my different size focus spots. Whereas I would have to go to the function key, tap, and then do that. I'm now saving myself a step by, uh, by mapping the trash can button to that, um, that different focus size. So that's definitely something, but you can set that to anything that you would find useful. Um, maybe you want uh, to have it toggle so that you can shoot JPEG and RAW or just JPEG only or just RAW only. You can customize that button to pretty much anything that you want, just as you saw here. Um, we have autofocus, like all the different menu settings just about give you those options. So there's lots of different things that you can do uh, and set that button to, so have fun with it. So number seven is uh, setting audio signals. You hear this? I don't like that verification signal whenever my camera achieves focus. It turns green around the focus area, so I know that focus has been achieved. There's also a green light down here. There's a lot of different things signaling to me that focus has been achieved, so I don't need that audio signal. Now there is one thing that they did add that's pretty cool, and that's when you rotate the, the ring, you get kind of this tick, 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 tick. It's really hard to hear, this tick, tick, tick sound, uh, kind of giving you some sort of feedback that something has changed. And so that was a problem that I had with the other cameras is that you know, if you're not looking at the screen, you're not, you don't necessarily know that you're uh, changing your aperture unless there's some really noticeable exposure difference on the screen. So I do like that, but I don't like it so much that I am okay with the beep. I don't like the beep at all whatsoever. Um, so in order to disable that, we're going to go to um, our 10th pane here and the camera, the second camera option menu and choose audio signals and we'll just go to shutter only now the bummer here is that it's literally just going to be the shutter and when you do take a picture there's an audible sound for the shutter there isn't a real sound for the shutter so uh, if i go and actually turn this off if you're just in single shot mode you can hear a little bit of a click sound so there's a little bit of a click but if you do go into a continuous mode, so let's go into our drive mode and go down to high speed shooting. If you have all audio signals turned off and you hold down that shutter button, I just took 30 images and there was no representation of anything happening on my screen until I let off. How annoying would that be if you accidentally took you know, a hundred photos on accident because there was nothing signaling to you that a photo was actually being taken. So I, I have to wait for the buffer to clear here, which it's about done. And then I can go back into the menu and I could choose shutter only. So now at least it, it's a horrible sound, but at least there's an audio signal for the shutter and I can hear that and know that photos are being taken. Uh, a lot of times I'm not using this camera in continuous mode, uh, in a continuous drive mode, so that's not really a problem. Um, but it is nice to at least have that one audio signal. But now with shutter only selected, focus, achieving focus does not make a beep, and I like that. I do not like the noise of achieving focus having a beep to it. So that's uh, a thing that I changed. Number eight, let's jump into video, and this video, this video is getting a lot longer than I wanted it to be, but we're gonna go ahead and change our camera mode here to video, and there's some things that we're gonna go into change, because like I said, I use this camera quite a bit for, uh, for shooting video, and so there are settings that need to be changed and adjusted. So the first thing is uh, on the first panel here of the second camera tab is changing it for, from exposure mode of program auto down to manual exposure. This essentially gives us the same type of functionality when shooting photos as far as being able to adjust our 
aperture, our shutter speed, and our ISO. Uh, I want to be able to have control over all of those, and so I have to go into that mode in order to get control. Uh, otherwise, that camera mode here is going to assume you want program auto, and it's going to do all of your settings automatically for you. So now I've been shooting everything in 4K, so I'm going to go up to XAVCS 4K and choose that option. I'm going to go down to record settings, and you can see we have different record settings down here. Um, this camera caps out at 30p uh, when you're shooting 4K, which is kind of a bummer. I was hoping we'd get 60, but we didn't. Um, but if you do go into HD and then go down to record settings, you get a whole slew of options, even all the way up to 120p. So keep in mind, when you are shooting in one of these modes, so for example, um, say we're shooting in, uh, in 60p, which you would shoot in one of these higher frame rates because you want more data for doing slow motion. So when you slow a clip down, you're essentially stretching that clip down. And if you stretch it out below 30 frames per second, then you're going to get blur and it's just not going to look good. So you want to shoot at at least 60p, if not 120, if you're going to be doing anything slow motion. Now, if you're going to be doing anything slow motion, and this is a mistake I made in my last video, so here's my public apology to anybody who called me out on this, um, is that your shutter speed needs to be double of what your frame rate is in order for your camera to do that. Uh, so if you're at 60p, you need to be at 100, at least 120, uh, like 125, because you can't go to 120. So you need to be at at least 125 in order for it to be capturing 60 frames per second. Now, if you're going to go up to that 120, then you're going to have to go up to 250 uh, in order to get that 120 frames per second. So keep that in mind that your shutter speed always has to be double of your frame rate. And I'll talk more about this in another video. Um, this isn't hard for me to achieve because I'm typically shooting in 4K, which means I get that 30p uh, and I'll do the 100 megabits just so I can get the um, best quality file that I can get. And then um, I can go down to, because I'm at 30, I can go down to 1 60th and be safe. Uh, which means I can, uh, you know, deepen my, I can use these adjustments such as closing down my aperture a little bit to get more depth of field or not having to rely so much on hiking my ISO to get more light uh, sensitivity on that, to get more sensitivity out of that sensor. A huge wish list item that didn't come true for me on this camera was having audio input, some sort of an audio in jack for a microphone. Uh, they also didn't change the audio recording, giving you anything other than on or off. There's no manual settings for your audio, but you can go and actually choose to turn on wind reduction for when you're outdoors in a more windy situation, you can turn on wind reduction from the menu. So that's definitely an option. I have seen people, because you have your two microphones up here on top of the camera, as you can see, and I have seen people uh, come up with creative ways to kind of muffle that. A lot of times with microphones, you put what's called a dead cat or some sort of a covering over the microphone that then cuts down the wind noise. Um, but on a camera like this, there's nothing to slip over. So you can maybe take like a little piece of cotton or something like that and put it over the top of that. Just keep in mind that anytime something hits that cotton, it's gonna make noise right into your microphone. So I typically don't do that. Just in windier situations, I use that uh, wind noise reduction. And when I have more control over my environment, I leave it turned off. Number nine is actually turning on the grid. Uh, the grid works nice because it's gonna give me the ability to more easily frame up my shot. Um, I like using the rule of thirds, and so I'm gonna go and turn grid lines on to rule of thirds grid. And as you can see now, it added lines to my preview here, my screen, so that I can more easily frame things up. This works really well, especially if you're gonna use this camera for vlogging and you're constantly pointing it back at you. Um, one of the issues is just making sure that you're framed up well or that your shot is framed up because everything kind of appears a little bit backwards. So having the rule of thirds just definitely helps you get uh, things framed up a little bit faster and make sure that you're not missing anything. Um, I also use um, that for portraits and whatnot. And so it makes it really nice to just to be able to tap um, or position the focal point on that rule of third, uh, which is where I typically would be 
putting the person that I was taking a picture of or even shooting maybe something like a little interview segment I would put them maybe off to one side versus the other. So the 10th thing is to add copyright data to your images. And we live in a digital world where our images are being shared everywhere. And if you wanna maintain some sort of rights on your image, you have to have the copyright data written to it. Now it's not impossible for somebody to strip this data out, but if it starts out as part of the image, then it's gonna be better. Uh, you'll have a better chance of proving that it was your image. Now this doesn't actually write information to the face of the image. It's metadata that exists within the image um, so that way when you pull up that data there's uh, underlying information about your image and some of that even includes your camera settings the type of camera it was used to shoot with it and all that stuff so if you go into uh, setup 5 here which is under the briefcase and the fifth pane tap on copyright turn copyright info to on go to set photographer tap there or click there because this is not touch activated unfortunately so you're gonna to need to go through and actually add your name or whatnot. And then when you're done, hit okay. Uh, you can then set copyright and you can put like all rights reserved or have fun using my images for free or whatever. I mean, there's, there's certain copyright uh, titles that need to be used in order. There's like Creative Commons and all that stuff. There's different ones that give different limits of access to your images. Um, you can set those as you wish and then display copyright will show you the preview of that. This is good to set just so that you can maintain control over your images, um, especially if you're like me, you're taking a lot of photos of your kids and stuff like that. Um, I've had blogs use my photos without me asking. Um, they've even told me like, are you sure it's your photo? And I'm like, look at the EXIF data or the metadata. I promised you, unless you stripped it out, that's my photo. Um, so it, it's just better to write that in and have the camera handle the, uh, the writing of that so that you don't have to do it in post-production later. Of course, I do that in Lightroom, uh, but if my image goes straight from my camera to my smartphone, I want that metadata to be in there um, already. So that's going to do it for this video. It was a longer video than I hoped for, but 10 tips, uh, 10 settings to change when you get your Sony RX100 Mark VI. I hope you enjoy the camera. I'm going to be back with more content on this camera, a full review, my thoughts on the camera, uh, some tutorials on how to better use the camera, and uh, if there's anything that you want to see, definitely let me know down in the comment section below.